Carrie Barrett, Associate Director. I'm so pleased to welcome you here to an evening of baseball and history and music um, in conjunction with our great little exhibition in the American Wing on breaking the color barrier, which I'll show you a slide of in a minute. I, a minute. I hope you all have time maybe after this tonight or on another occasion to go visit our incredible baseball card collection. What you've been, I need a slide. What you've been looking at while you were sitting here is part of our new ad campaign, the It's Time We Met Four campaign. We, I want Alex Rodriguez on the screen really badly. I'm going to be really lonely up here. I'll just tell you, we're so happy. This is not only Friday the 13th. Somebody called this event really complicated. It's Friday the 13th. It was the home opener for the Yankees. They won. Right? Alex Rodriguez apparently hit his 630th home run to bring it in. And if we got a slide, what I want to show you, I'll just, what we've been, there we go. What we've been talking about, what you've been seeing, the loop that you've been watching is our new ad campaign. We're shameless about this sort of thing. One of the things that we've been trying to do through our new website and through our collection in general is to get all of you more involved with the kinds of things we knew. I'm, I'm now associate director, but until about two years ago, I was a curator in the American Wing. My specialty is weird things like portraits of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson founding fathers, but it doesn't mean I don't know about baseball, all those good American things. But we, and, and the baseball card collection was always shown in the American way, so it was one of my favorite, favorite things in the museum, and very, very few people know that we have this amazing collection of baseball cards. Um, it keys into something that we're working on now that I want you all to participate in. We invited a variety of celebrities, including Alex Rodriguez, to tell us why they like the Met. And you can see, you saw a lot of them going by. You saw Alicia Keys and, and other celebrities um, going by and about their view of the Met, what they come here to see. He said, the Met is, the Met is where my game, my Met, my, my Met, my legends. The Met is where the action is, off the field. You can hang out with the legends of the past and the icons of today. And, and we allowed them to pick. And so who knew that he would pick an Andy Warhol of Jackie Onassis? Not everything that he picked was about sport, but he also picked a Greek vase. And I want to show you that you can do this too. So the pitch is, and we pick, we pick one kind of public viewer a week. So what you're, I didn't bring that one, but how to participate. You can see the celebrities that we asked um, Jeff Koons, Zaha Hadid, Claire Danes, there's um, Seth Meyers from, I'll paraphrase his quote, which is so funny, the Saturday Night Live guy who said that he thought, he, you know, when he does Weekend Update, he thinks he knows everything, and then when he comes to the Met, he realizes he's a complete idiot. <laughs> so th this is the, your, your Met. So we, we like to be the authorities of our collection, but more and more and more we're trying to engage audiences who just tell us what you like. And so if you go on our website, you can actually do this. You can participate. But for tonight, what we want to celebrate is this breaking the color barrier, this great week that we're celebrating, and the exhibition that celebrates through our baseball card collection, this incredible achievement in, in baseball and in, in, in really what Jefferson Burdick did for us, the great collector through baseball cards of recognizing players of all denominations, of all races, and who knew that we would be standing here in 2012 looking at this incredible collection as a representation of how those barriers were broken through an art form that was so popular but so, so really, really incredible. This is, of course, one of the great cards that we have of, of Jackie Robinson. This is the kind of thing that we have in the collection that you can see on view today. Um, I promised to bring gum tonight, but somehow didn't arrive at my desk this afternoon. But these are these are the, these are called the red number on green stitch ball. But tops chewing gum. How many of you remember tops? You have to be old enough to remember tops chewing gum, right? Created the largest series of cards, and this set was designed by Cy Berger and Woody Gelman. This is real graphic art for us, not just stuff that we stuck in our pockets when we were kids and hoped that the gum was tastier. I used to say. You'd save it, but um, but there were always traditional tobacco and candy cards. Baseball cards were were bigger, and they compiled one of the great steps forward that Topps did was that you can see there's Ernie Banks from the Chicago Cubs, the Cubs logo, his signature, and then as most of you know, on the back of it would have been statistics to the date of the card, which was such a cool and wonderful thing. Here's more just to tantalize what your appetite. Eddie Yost. Hank Thompson, who remembers the New York Giants, right? You know, they're not a baseball team anymore. Even I know that. 
You can go see these cards now in the loose center. We rotate them. Um, you can also see them by appointment. If any of you really are baseball cardophiles, we take appointments to look at these baseball cards in our prints and drawings collection. And there are many, many, many of them, hundreds of them, compiled into books by this great man, Jefferson Burdick. What I'm told, what I'm told, um, what, what the received wisdom on Jefferson Burdick is that he himself never went to a baseball game. Which is so interesting. His, his interest was not in baseball, it was in cards. He's what we call a cardophile, and he collected cards of all sorts. This is him in his library. I was looking at this today, trying to figure out there's sort of a cowboy. There's all kinds of strange and wonderful, wonderful memorabilia. He was a bachelor. He is great. He loved to collect. He would just pour through auction catalogs and was, was a great, great collector of all sorts of cards. And I thought that since the rest of the night was about baseball, I would also give you kind of dimension in just a few minutes on Mr. Burdick, who, because he had no heirs, um, actually, in, in about in, in, in 1947, gave his entire collection of cards to the Met. It's one of the great kind of popular, popular collections that we have um, today. This is, of course, an Easter card, which I thought was kind of timely. A little bit after Easter, but good. <coughs> Baseballs, dark velvet, in the, or um, um, uh, butterflies, botany was another kind of card that he had. And these were designed by Louis Prang. These are colored lithographs on a card. And it's amazing to think that at the time, he probably didn't know that these were truly, truly collectible, but they're extraordinarily rare. A bachelor's buttons, here's another one, um, this in the, in the field of botany. Many, many of these cards. A water dog, they're just great. Water dog, maybe, maybe used for baseball, but these were issued by Goodwin and Company from about 1890, so they run the gamut through the late 19th century into the 20th century, and then the baseball cards kind of, kind of end. Carl, um, Carl Mackensee Chess, an old judge, and, and this is um, um, the advertisement at the bottom, old judge and gyp gypsy queen cigarettes. This would have been a card from, I believe, the 19, or 1888, Goodwin and Company. The collection is just huge. Here's a couple other fun ones. Baking powder and sterling baking powder, these great circus ads that he would have collected. Gathering them all in the most kind of, as you can guess, obsessive way, just as, we won't reveal who you are, but those of you who have ever collected baseball cards or anything like this, kind of obsessively scrapbooking them, notating them, collecting, um, connecting us to where he had actually gotten them. Here's a Grandma Moses that he gave us, um, a real interesting kind of primitive popular art. And great, great views, cards. We have a whole array of cards that, um, that record the early New York. Here's the Flatiron, Flatiron Building and the Empire State Building, cards that he would have collected from, from the 1930s. And I want to end, before I introduce um, our, our next feature, with these great views of the Metropolitan Museum. He collected postcards, too, including postcards that were sent. So this is a great one. There's a message on the back side, but the one on the front is, is wonderful. Interested in art, this is full of nice things. <laughs> Isn't that great? I think it's kind of, get, get, we spend a lot of time on our grand mission statement, but that should be it. This is a place that is full of nice things. So we have an evening of nice things for you, a panel discussion, and then a great, great performance by the baseball project that I know you're all looking forward to. So I want to hand the microphone over to my colleague, Chris, Chris Gorman, who is co-chair of Spectrum. Hope you come to a lot of the events, and he's going to introduce our panel tonight. Thank you all for coming so much. Evening, everybody. game of musical chairs before we get started here. So uh, my name is Chris Gorman. Um, I'm co-chair of Spectrum here at the Met. I want to welcome you all to the museum. Um, tonight we've organized a panel uh, in honor of Breaking the Color Barrier in Major League Baseball, uh, which is a superb exhibition that's on view right now until June 17th. Um, we're also celebrating the Jefferson Burdick Collection, which is one of the most comprehensive collections of baseball cards in America. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, to my left, New York Times sports columnist and author of $40 Million Slaves, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Black Athlete, Bill Roden. And then, uh, next 
on our on our panel team here is uh, columnist Syracuse Post Standard and author of uh, The Ashes of Lou Gehrig and winner of the 2008 Ernie Pyle Award for Human Interest Writing, Sean Kirst. <laughs> Next to Sean is former Major League Baseball player and two-time National League MVP, Dale Murphy. <laughs> and next to Dale is author, vice chairperson of the Jackie Robinson Foundation and daughter of Jackie Robinson, Sharon Robinson. I'd just like to give a special shout out uh, to current Major League pitcher for the Los Angeles Angels in town for a series against uh, the New York Yankees, Mr. LaTroy Hawkins. <laughs> so Sharon, uh, Sharon, let's go back to October 1945. Um, your father signs with the uh, Montreal Royals, part of the Brooklyn Dodgers organization. Tell us about his first spring training in 1946 um, and the months that followed. Yes, um, well, for, in 45, actually, my father met with Branch Rickey in his office, and they um, had that famous meeting where Branch Rickey did, basically did, prepared him for what he was going to be facing through role playing. And it was a very tough. Um, meeting between a black man and a, and a white man at a time when black men and white men didn't sit down to negotiate any kind of business contract. Um, and Branch Rickey is much older than my father and sort of, so they get past that point and my father says, yes, I'll, I, I'll do it. And uh, Branch Rickey then assigns him to the Montreal team um, because he felt that it would be a, a smoother entry um, for, for my father and it turned out to be a very in Montreal, the, the Canadians welcomed my parents, actually, both of them. And uh, they were very proud of, of the role they played and, and how much support they gave to um, the, the entire experiment. But when they traveled south of Canada um, is when they ran into um, all, all kinds of forms of racism, from death threats to physical attacks uh, to verbal attacks, to isolation, um, and Branch Rickey had structured it so that that first spring training my mother would travel with my father, but I'll just give you one example. They, uh, we all know Sanford, Florida now, is that correct? Well, Sanford, Florida was the town that Branch Rickey had selected for the first spring training. And when my parents arrived, uh, they were traveling with the columnist, uh, Wendell Smith uh, Pittsburgh. from Pittsburgh, yes, and uh, they put they couldn't stay in the same hotel with the rest of the team, so they stay, stayed in a doctor's house in town, um, and they were just unpacking when Wendell comes racing back to the house and says, "We've got to go now," and you just you know didn't tell my father what was going on, and you know, my father's really annoyed because you know what's going on, and as it turns out, they said a mob was coming after my father because they refused, they were not going to allow a black, uh, them to field a black and white team. So that's sort of Sanford's uh, history some 65 plus years ago. <laughs> As you can see, it hasn't. Um... <laughs> um, you, you touched on Branch Rickey a bit, um, and Bill, you wrote some about Branch Rickey in your book. Um, what can you tell us about him and his relationship with Jackie Robinson? Yeah, we just talked about this. I mean, it was really... A very fascinating relationship, and I think that's that always sort of gets to one of the crux. I mean, you know, Jackie Robinson has so many different <coughs> tentacles, depending on how old you are, whether you saw him play, whether you didn't, whether you went to North South. But I think that um, the relationship at first, I think, was uh, you know, uh, employee employer, with with a twist. I mean, this was a very historic relationship. So I think that's that that's what separates from employer. But, but I think at the end of the day, it's still employee employer. Uh, you still have to perform. And uh, I know how, you know. I mean, you know, Branch Rickey. I know how difficult this is going to be. I know it's going to be hard. But at the end of the day, you've got to perform, and probably have more pressure on you because you're not just. It's not like you're the average ball player. You know, you're carrying. 
a lot of a lot of stuff on your plate on your shoulders. So I think um, during those years, I think it was just employee employer. I, I think that uh, as as they as as Jackie retired, as time went on, and I think the depth and the magnitude of what they each had accomplished uh, uh, blossomed. I think the, the friendship blossomed because if you think about it. That relationship was probably one of the most unique relationships between an African American and a white man. I don't want to be too dramatic, but in, in, in at least the modern history of the United States. Um, so yeah, I think that it's one of those things at first. And, and remember, as as, as Sharon said, Jackie was a young man, so this is also a mentorship relationship as well. You're trying to learn a lot of different things. So, uh, but I think that the. I read somewhere where I think Jackie was saying that if it were not for Brian Tricky, he probably would not be in baseball. He probably would not have been in baseball. Now you touched on performance, and uh, Dale, you came up in the Atlanta Braves organization. Um, played in the minor leagues as all ball players tend to before they make it to the big show. Tell us a little bit about that and about um, some of the ups and downs of those days when you think, oh, I'm going to make it, those days where you, you're struggling a bit. Well, yeah, I think a lot of uh, People look back on my career and think about my days with the Atlanta Braves, and I'm thankful for that because my path to the Atlanta Braves wasn't very smooth or straight. Um, I had some days where uh, I felt like quitting. Actually, I was a catcher at one time, and one of my teammates said, well, Murph, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I'm thankful that I, I, I came up through the Atlanta Braves organization uh, and, and Bobby Cox was there. Um, I was really lucky. My first boss when I signed um, a professional contract was Bill Lucas. Bill Lucas was, uh, for all intents and purposes, his title wasn't general manager, but he was the general manager of the, when I signed, he was the minor league director of player personnel. And uh, the next year, Ted Turner made him um, I don't know exact title, but he was basically running everything, and uh, the first uh, um, African American in that in that position. Um, Bill uh, tragically lost his life in, uh, from a, a stroke and aneurysm in 1978. Uh, he made had a great impact on my career. He believed in me, and I uh, gave me a chance when I was struggling trying to find a position. And uh, everybody that was able to work for him and close to him was very thankful for the chance to know him. He was a person that didn't see black or white, and uh, he, he saw the goodness in people. And it was a, I was very blessed to be able to play for him, and it worked out cause, mainly because he believed in me. Great. Because um, you talked about pressure and, and some days, you know, feeling uh, down on yourself as a player, and all players um, experience that. But um, there's one city in particular, Sean, that uh, Jackie Robinson uh, recalled being one of the harshest on him. Um, and when we talk about pressure, we talk about the pressure of just trying to make the team. There were other pressures on Jackie Robinson that Sharon and Bill have talked about. What, were, what happened in what, what city was it? When, uh, when I was a child, I read, as, as many of us from our generation did, I read a lot of the great you know, biographies of the, these guys from the Golden Age. And I remember reading a couple of biographies of Jackie where he spoke about uh, where he talked about being in Syracuse and what was known as the Black Cat incident, that, that he was playing there uh, from 1946 when he first came in. And um, some of the guys in the Chiefs threw a black cat onto the field and uh, said, hey, Jackie, here's your cousin. And to which he responded by double. He got a double. So, so, so when, I, when I arrived, and, uh, and I also want to say as we could go on, what a pleasure and an honor it is just to sit on the same panel as you and, and to thank you for everything your family has done for. But when I arrived in Syracuse as, as a young writer, I was, I was stunned by the, the fact that the town had not come to terms with this and, and began to do some research and, and found some articles where, where they were at the end of the 1946 season when the Associated Press asked Jackie uh, what was the hardest city in the International League. He was. He, even then, you remember all the restraints he was under, that he couldn't really just say, this city treated me awfully, but he said, in Syracuse, they rode me pretty hard. He singled out Syracuse, and I started to go back, and it turned out that that entire team was from the Deep South, and, and uh, um, 
I, I spoke to a guy named Garden Del Savio, a New Yorker who was on that team, who said, who remembered that uh, three players had to be restrained from taking the field in blackface again when, when they played against Jackie. That uh, that um, pitchers had, on Syracuse had thrown on his head at his head throughout the season. And what Del Savio remembered that has always stayed with him is you remember the situation where where he could not physically fight back even when people were trying to harm him. And that Del Savio said that he would say to him, I barnstormed against this guy. If you taunt him, he's only going to play better. And that, that even when Jackie grounded out and they'd be screaming at him, the garden said the worst thing is you can scream at another human being. He would jog back above the dugout as close as he could come with his, with his head up and, and just ignore it and sort of just, just you know, take that abuse and, and get up the next time. Wow. Well, that was one way he dealt with it. And then, Sharon, what were some of the other ways uh, your father rose above that pressure? He, he wrote in his own book, in his autobiography, that there were times where he felt he was about to succumb to it, but he, he didn't. And how, how did he rise above that? Well, I think three basic things. His mother, his wife, and his faith. Um, and, you know, so when you got down, he used to believe that he was being tested and, you know, stay down for a minute, but you get back up. But he had ways to work out um, anger, too, um, and, and uh, some funny ways. He, he loved golf, and he would say, well, it's a little white ball. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, the, the, um, <laughs> I love that, I use that, blood. I talk to kids all the time, and that's one of the, the stories that I talk about, because I want them to understand that the strength of character that it took to hold back, and that it wasn't because he was accepting, you know, that. So as he, as he, um, he makes it to second, and then he's brought home. My father's brought home on that same black hat incident. So as you, Sean talked about how he would come close to the dugout. So as he was rounding that dugout, he looked over at the, uh, the Syracuse team and said, well, I guess my cousin's happy now. <laughs> so he always had his way of getting back without, you know, Fight back with fists. Well, also included um, in the current exhibition of cards that are up is um, a baseball card of Willie Mays. Um, Dale, growing up, yeah, you were a pretty big fan of his. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, I'm born and raised in Portland, Oregon. Uh, lived there until uh, I was about eight. And then for a couple of years, we lived, uh, when I was nine and ten, we lived in the Bay Area. Then we eventually moved back to Portland. But while I was in the Bay Area, uh, one day, my dad brought a glove home and said, Here, here's the new glove for you. It's the one Willie Mays uses. Of course, I was down there, and the Giants were there, and occasionally we'd go to the, the Giants game, and Willie was the guy. And uh, I said, So this is this is Willie's glove. And when he said, This is the one Willie uses, I figured he meant that literally. <laughs> and uh, and uh, my first recollection of collecting cards is finding a Willie Mays card with him holding his glove <laughs> in the car. And I don't I probably didn't need a magnifying glass back then because I could see which I can't see anymore. But I, I looked at his glove, I looked at mine, and I, you know, across the road, the, the top of the web is the stitching. It goes around, so I counted the stitches on my on my glove. And I looked at his card and I counted the stitches. And they were the same. <laughs> they were the same. And I'm looking at that glove. And, and it was, uh, my mom and dad brought, have my glove. I have it now at my house. But my mom and dad, about six months ago, brought it to me. And I pulled it out and I looked at it. And, and so I, now with, thank, uh, with the internet, I started doing a search. Uh, the, the glove my dad got me was a, a McGregor kangaroo leather. Uh, it, it, I've got pictures of me playing at that age, and it looks like it covers half my body. And uh, it was, actually. Uh, you can't do that. You can't really get what a major league player now. It, they're $250, $300 gloves. But back then, you could go into a store and use the exact same model that he really used. And on the internet, they said, that is the exact model that he used. And so I thought that was pretty exciting. It wasn't literally his, but it was the exact same, obviously. I, I, I was sharing, sharing the story, story with my son, Chad, who's here, my oldest son, Chad. And I said, Chad, it was really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I, I looked at these cards. And um, uh, that, was that was 19, you know, when I was 10, 1966. 
I, I didn't think at that time, and I, to me that was an introduction to me that one of the great things about baseball, baseball cards and sports, at, at that point in my life, they were baseball players. I didn't, and my son Chad said, Dad, you mean the, the, the black players, the white players, the Dominican players, the Puerto Rican players, they were all in the same pack. And I said, yeah, that's right, <laughs> they were. I didn't ever think about that. And now knowing that not too many years earlier, um, now having read and found out that not that many years earlier in the minor leagues in the South, um, um, those players in the 50s were not allowed into the city to stay at the, stay at the same hotel as the white players. And I just, I, I, I just, you know, now that I've learned that, I, I can't imagine that. But my introduction to cards and baseball is that, and, and uh, I think it helped me uh, grow up without a feeling in that generation in, in, to a certain extent. You know, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for that introduction that didn't, didn't see color. And uh, it's a great memory for me. Thank you. Um, and Bill, in, in your view, um, and you touched on this in your book again, um, how did Willie Mays uh, change the game of baseball? Let's just put it. Let's put a narrow story. Just, just one quick thing about the. Uh, well, my mentor. I worked. My first newspaper job was Afro American newspaper, and my mentor was Sam Lacey, who was, uh, you know, just the great Sam Lacey. I think he died at age 100, and um, you know, literally, he was 100. Uh, but he used to tell these stories, you know. So, uh, as I got older, it's kind of like with uh, uh, Jackie and with. Um, Branch, he became, we became more friends. And so the great thing about Sam is that he knew everybody, he knew who they really were back then. Because, you, know, you know, over time, people, they were one way, but then as time goes, oh, I was liberal. And Sam's, oh, no, 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 let me tell you who this guy was. But one of the things he said is that, uh, you know, he was crusading. You know, there was a whole thing about the black players couldn't stay at the, uh, at the uh, white hotels. So Sam, of course, and Wendell, they were crusading to get the guys to the White Hotel, and the players were kind of pissed off. Said, "Wait, whoa, whoa, wait! You don't understand. We, you know, we're saying in the black neighborhood, we got a ball. We have no, we have no curfew. We got, and you said you want to move us into the hotel, Sam? Why don't you? We understand where you're coming from, but why don't you just back off? You know. So there's always a reality of civil rights. But anyway, but in terms of, <laughs> but, but, but in terms of uh, Willie Mays, uh, the only thing I could because Willie Mays is kind of like, for me, talking about how high is up. So I could just narrow it down. Willie Mays, well, I grew up in Chicago. And, you know, the, the, the greatest group of play I ever saw was the San Francisco Giants. No offense to anybody here, book that, but realistically, it was the San Francisco Giants with Willie Mays, Juan Marshall. So the basket catch, I must have spent my entire 10 and 11 years trying to do the basket catch. I mean, literally, I would stand out in the yard. I would stand out in the yard, and I would, like, throw the ball up and then just try to do like this. <laughs> and the key thing with, with, the, with the way Willie Mays did it, it was a whole idea of being effortless, effortless. And, I mean, I got hit in the head. I got hit in, But what he taught me, though, what I got from Willie Mays was this whole notion of being cool, of, of making the most infinitely hard thing Effortless. And I think that's the stylistic thing that I think even beginning with your dad, bringing that thing in from, from the Negro Leagues, where style was very, very, very important. Not what you did, that was important too, but the way you did it. And Willie Mays, I remember I described him, I was, Ron Santo hit this like screaming thing that, that used to be the gap before Willie Mays. It used to be the gap. <laughs> and I remember, you know, Willie Mays had those glasses, you know, flip them down. And it was like, it was a screaming thing that looked like it was going to be a double or something. And Mays just seemed to just glide over it and just kind of did like he got to it. The fans were going nuts and crazy. And he just kind of got to it, just did like this. <laughs> and flipped it back like that was the easiest thing he had done all year. Yeah. So, so anyway, so you asked me about his, but I think that was probably his signature on the game. He was, remember, I think when Jackie came in, Jackie was older. 
when Willie got there, Willie was 19. And so that was the beginning of getting young, seeing what a young black athlete looked like in his prime. So I think that was the style, and then young was, was probably his big you know, contribution. Yeah, we're talking about icons tonight. We're talking about um, a, lot of, a lot of things that uh, changed baseball. Um, and you know, we're talking about some superstars. And Jefferson Burdick really was a superstar collector. Um, there is uh, one of the, if not the rarest card in existence in the Burdick collection. Um, it's the Honus Wagner T206 card. Um, Sean, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, why is that card so rare? Tell us a little bit about Honus Wagner. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny when you think about baseball cards now, we associate them with bubble gum. In uh, 1909, the uh, American Tobacco Company releases a series of Major League Baseball cards, three or 400 cards, and uh, they used them as a backing for 10 cigarettes, and, and, you know, you bought a pack of cigarettes and you got this card. And uh, at that time, 1909, arguably the greatest player in baseball was Honus Wagner, Hans Wagner for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I, I was just reading... Uh, a piece the other day that noted that the season he had, I believe, in 1909, in many ways, was the greatest offensive season for any National League player until Barry Bonds broke the home run record 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, so Wagner finds out about these baseball, this, this uh, baseball card and this pack of cigarettes, and, and he writes to the company and says, I want you to stop distributing it. There's, there's all sorts of debate now about whether he did that because he was against smoking, or, uh, because, or whether it was a monetary thing, he chewed tobacco. But, but even then, there was a, as, as there is now, there was somehow this distinction between dipping and chewing and smoking, for better or worse. But uh, so, so they recall him. They only, and, and historians differ on how many got out there, but, but the usual figure that gets thrown around is 50 to 200. And, and um, you know, years go by, and, and baseball cards reemerge in the 50s, and as they became this uh, burgeoning hobby, and, and, and slowly became a business, this became the most coveted of baseball cards worth literally millions now, at, well, at least one of them worth literally millions at auction. And there's one, I think, in uh, St. Louis that um, might go up to auction. I think the papers they were saying it might fetch something like $2.5 million, which is, um, for, a, for a small baseball card, that's a big chunk of change. Sean, were you going to? No, I was amazed. Yep. We'll all pitch in, everybody in the crowd will contribute. Maybe we'll have a quarter of it. Um, the, uh, the thing I, I think about when I think about Honus Wagner, I think about Jackie Robinson. Um, it's an idea of principle. Um, and uh, Dale, since you know you retired from the game, I know you've been doing a lot of work with kids. Um, you have a couple books out. Uh, the scouting reports, I think, are in the titles there. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing um, with kids out um, around the country. Well, I've been uh, very fortunate with some friends of mine to form a, a character education foundation called the I Won't Cheat Foundation, where uh, the, the basic message is um, to kids that whatever you do in life, you can do it the right way. I think there's so many messages out there, and, and baseball is, 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 has uh, had a few issues with this. Uh, all, a lot of the sports have. And I think baseball's doing a lot better now, but we had a, a problem with telling kids that you – you uh, have to take this drug, you have to take that drug to be the best ball, baseball player that you could be. So that was real frustrating for me, so we formed this foundation, and that's basically what we try to let kids know, is that you, you can do whatever you want to do in life, and you can do it the right way. You don't have to uh, cut corners, you don't have to bend the rules. Um, one of the challenges for, for, for me with the, the baseball and the steroid era, um, I know that's a discussion for another time, but that it, you know, not, not everybody was doing that in the game. The perception to the kids was that, that must, this must be what you have to do. That was real frustrating to me and to a lot of players. So that's, um, you know, I enjoy sharing that message with kids, and, uh, and I appreciate where baseball has gone now. We've made great improvement. I think we're really going in the right direction. And, and cleaning the game up and, um, and sending a good message to kids. Uh, that's, that's what it's all about to me. Um, and that leads really nicely um, into uh, something that Sean wrote at the end of an article in uh, 1997. Uh, it was an article about Jackie Robinson in Syracuse. Um, and he was talking in that article about um, some of the things that uh, Jackie Robinson faced. And uh, what Sean finished the article with was the question now, after, at that time it was 50 years, so now we're at 65 years, 65 years since then, um, is what do we do about it? And uh, I just wanted to 
go one by one and um, maybe just say a bit about uh, where we're at today baseball-wise. Dale touched on a little bit. Um, we, we all know, uh, I think, that Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball is coming up on Sunday. Um, so, Bill. Um, you know, I, I think that... Um there's, 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 we have a danger, and particularly at this particular time, when things just become cliche. So you say, Jackie Robinson is here, Jackie Robinson, but we kind of gloss over what he means. And, and, and this is sort of what it means to me. There, there's, I live in Harlem, USA, and um, I live uh, right across from Yankee Stadium. So right down the bluff, there's Jackie Robinson, uh, the, the Jackie Robinson Park. So anyway, so one day, you know, when I walk down the street, there's a whole little collection of guys who guys are always talking sports and talking trash. There's one guy came out, and he was just said, Mr. Rowe, Mr. Rowe, you know, why doesn't anybody talk about um, Michael, uh, Michael Jordan anymore? And not everybody's talking about LeBron James and all that kind of stuff. And so, and I said, you know, uh, you, know you know this park down there is Jackie Robinson Park, right? See, now, why do you think Jackie Robinson died in, you know, 1972, okay? And it was like 2003. Now, why do you think that people are still talking about Jackie Robinson? Now, with Michael Jordan, some people talk about how, how many points he scores and all that, but, but, you know, people kind of, but why do you think 30-something years later, people are still talking about Jackie Robinson? And so he kind of thought about it. And we started talking, and it's, well, it was because... Not it was because what he stood for. He stood for some things that were beyond just balls and strikes. He stood for the greater good. He stood for character. He stood for courage. He stood, you know, and in, in all of our lives, it's sort of what are you going to stand for? Do you stand for the, 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 the short and narrow thing? Or do you stand for something that's going to make an impact? That's something that's larger than yourself. So that's why people remember Jackie Robinson. That's why people remember people like you know, Joe Lewis, and that's why there are a lot of guys that we talk about who, after you quit, they'll forget who you were or what you did because you didn't really stand for anything. So to me, if you ask the lingering thing of Jackie Robinson, it's, it's, it's about character and heroics and doing things by example. Just uh, uh, two really quick things. I, I wanted to finish the last thought when you asked me about Burdick and the, the Wagner card, uh, that this guy from Syracuse, Jefferson Burdick, this, this uh, elderly bachelor dying of a neuromuscular disease with, with, you know, didn't have two nickels to rub together, that he donated one to the Met, understanding the, the power of posterity and that, that, you know, that card is worth a million dollars and it's here because this guy gave it to us. But your question about, about um, Jackie and what do we do now, in, in a different part of my life, I've, I've worn a different hat and have coached in city little leagues where, where I had the, uh, the honor really of meeting your mom who was incredibly supportive of this. And, and uh, I'll hear so many people, so many coaches in little league baseball uh, around Syracuse and I think nationally who will say because it's so easy, well, well, African-American children don't want to play baseball anymore. And, and my experience going to schools in the city, my, my wife's a teacher in the city, is that, is that kids want to play very much, but that we can't, use, we can't use the norms of 1957 anymore in attempting to attract these children, that you have kids in, in neighborhoods riddled with gun violence who aren't going to walk two miles to practice in another part of town, and, and that we've got to start meeting these kids where they are and that they want to play, they want to compete, but that the, the burden, the onus is on us to bring the game to them and not expect a seven-year-old to, to make a preposterously difficult decision to come to us. I, I, you know, I think the state, the, the state of the game of baseball is, is okay. I think there's some good things, but I have some real concerns. Um, one of the things I love about sports is, is it, people come from all over the world. You, you, you make a team based on your merit you know, and, and you're representative of the community. And I don't think Major League Baseball really represents our community, uh, America, uh, the United States. We represent the world in a lot of ways. We, we have players from uh, Latin America, Asia, Australia, and, the, and, and here, obviously. But I may be a little off on my statistics, but I think 6%, 6% of the, of the players in the Major Leagues are African-American. 
Uh, I think a lot of people see a major league game and think, well, it's, there's, there's, there's some, some um, African Americans playing out there. Well, those are Latin Americans. I think we've got to figure out what to do. I'm not saying I have the answer. I think I know part of the answer is it's, it's economic. There's 25 scholarships in football. Um, basketball does a real good job of marketing. Baseball does not have a lot of scholarships available in college sports, so kids make an economic decision and say, I need my college paid for, I'm going to go play football. We've got to figure out what to do, either endow scholarships or something, make it attractive to everybody, um, uh, to kids all over. I, I really can't comment on the RBI program for Major League Baseball, but I do know in Atlanta I heard from somebody who's been involved in it that it wasn't a success. Now, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, yeah, they're, they're back in Atlanta? Oh, good, good. Because uh, I had to, well. uh, they're doing well, good. That's why I, I, I talked to a guy that, that he, was, he was a little frustrated. I think, I think baseball needs to, we've got to figure out how to help these kids in some way, I think, eco economically, because very few kids in college get scholarship money to play baseball. You don't have enough to go around, so they split up their scholarships. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's good news. I'm, I'm glad to hear that about Atlanta because um, we, we got to figure out what to do. Yeah, I hear 6%. Is that right? Nine. It's 9? Well, there you go. It's getting better already. Um, <laughs> and and uh, uh, that, that, that's good, but that, that's, that's not enough. It, it's, it's not where it needs to be. We're, we're missing out on seeing some tremendous ball players and athletes that are not being exposed to baseball in the African-American community that, that I think would make, it just would, it would be better representation of, of America if we could figure out how to keep increasing that. So I'm, I hope I wasn't speaking out of, well, I was. I, I didn't have all my statistics, but uh, I, think, I think we can do a better job. You know, first, I, I'd like to uh, really thank Latroy for coming out today because um, Latroy and I met years ago when I was in, going to school visit in, in uh, what was that, Minnesota? Jeez. Um, but in 19, uh, you will remember this, in 1997 when we celebrated the 50th anniversary, the players like Jackie Who. Um, so in 15 years, um, you know, we've come a long way in raising their awareness and ha having them feel a part of um, Jackie Robinson and that he is, has a legacy and they're part of that legacy. So for Latroy to come out after a, a, on a game day um, and, and to be in the community and come by and see the, the card collection and uh, take me to dinner, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> He's here with Alan Price from the Players Association. Now, is, is, is Della here? Della. Della, would you please stand up? Del Britton Bays is the president of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. She's Allison's here too. She got better. Allison is here. Okay. Uh, Allison is with the Jackie Robinson Foundation. So, um, anyway, legacy. Um, you know, my mother has really led the way in terms of as a Jackie Robinson legacy, and um, you know, baseball is a piece of it, um, but the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Uh, Della, if you help me with the numbers here, we have... I don't know if you all heard that. 1,400 alum, college alum, about $15 million in scholarship support, 5-0, correct? And um, it's not just a dis over 39 years. Thank you. <laughs> My mother started six months after my father died, <laughs> that I remembered. <laughs> um, but the important thing is that it is not just, we don't just grant scholarships, it's a leadership development organization, and Della has been our, at the helm of it for the past six years, and she's really um, brought a great deal of um, life and energy and strength to the program, so I have to thank her for years of hard work and we hope at some point we will also have a Jackie Robinson Museum. That is her, one of her other projects. Um, in two years. You heard it from Della. <laughs> um, so, so legacy. And there are other areas we see legacy. Um, 
but children is, has been the heart of what my family has done. So I do a program with Major League Baseball uh, that's in schools across the country. Also character education. And our theme is overcoming obstacles or breaking barriers. And we have kids um, that have um, studied what an obstacle is and then they write an essay, part of a national essay contest. And we get thousands of essays from kids who write about how Jackie Rob one of Jackie Robinson's nine values have help has helped them get to the get over their barrier. So for example, our grand prize winner this year is a fifth grader out of Indianapolis and she is Indian. And as she said, from India. And she um, has been bullied um, by girls because of her skin color. And so she finally uh, discovered dance and she was so excited because she had this Mondays where she could go to dance class which she loved. And she got to dance class and the, and the girls have been bullying her at dance class as well. So she has gone, you know, she's taken the next step. It was always about getting over that barrier and has, um, you know, really made her school and her parents and all aware of what's going on so she can get some help um, with this. So anyway, it's um, a very wonderful program. But uh, my mother uh, turns 90 this year. And uh, you will see her if you watch the game on Sunday. And Lord Troy will be, you pitching, Lord Troy? Hopefully pitching. <laughs> and we're at number 42. And, um, and my mother will be there. And she, may wear her yellow, she might wear her yellow jacket again, so she's very visible. But she's uh, very gorgeous and very much alive and very much still active in the foundation. Well, thank you all. So uh, that concludes our panel. Um, stick around, we'll be right back with the baseball project. Thank you very much.